Hi, my name is Jasno Francoeur. Welcome to DigiPen's Masterclass Series. Today we are going to talk about the industry, both as an animator in the film industry and also as an educator. And then we will segue into talking about the animation silos and about working in the industry from a variety of different angles. So let's get started. I began my career at the animation studio in Florida. They had an internship program that was running out of that studio at the time. And in 1990, I joined a small team, about eight people, which was a typical size for the internships back then. And after that, in 1992, I was hired to do a VFX apprenticeship in Los Angeles under the tutelage of Randy Fulmer. Fall of 2004, I joined DigiPen for their inaugural BFA program, and I have been with DigiPen ever since, so going on 15 years now. I spent four years as an animation professor teaching mostly character animation and also character design, and then was asked uh, by the executives in 2008 to help stand up our brick and mortar, new brick and mortar program in Singapore. So I did that for about three years, and then did the same thing in Spain in 2011. During my tenure in Singapore, I was very fortunate to undergo the Lucasfilm VFX training workshop with Ted Lechman. This was a workshop for educators. Of course, it helped us do outreach with them and figure out what their hiring needs were because industries uh, tend to work hand in glove with educational institutions. And then in 2012, I came back to work with Raymond Yan as the program director for the BFA program in Redmond. That is where I am currently today. So these are some of the films that I have worked on, about 11 features, a number of shorts, certainly a number of park projects that are not uh, in the reel that I will be showing. Then I also worked on the Aladdin Sega Genesis 2D side-scrolling game. So this is a professional reel. I'm going to start with Brother Bear, which was my last picture. It was directed by Aaron Blaze. I was one of the supervising animators on the transformation sequence. Nothing more fun to animate than magic, because you have real world physics combined with uh, uh, what you extrapolate from your imagination. And then of course, you know when you work on a film that it's gonna have a particular style, and you also know uh, the type of elements that will be in it uh, according to the story. So in this case, we knew that we'd be working on mostly organic elements, no man-made elements, no man-made props or sci-fi effects. And so it was a real great opportunity to learn how to animate uh, the rugged outdoors. Some of the scenes, of course, more subtle than others. Not every scene that you get is gonna be a money shot. On Mulan, I was typecast for a little bit as kind of the blow em up guy. Worked on a lot of fireworks and explosions. Gotta kill the bad guy, that's always fun. Of course, you always get a sequence when you work on a film uh, for continuity's sake. Following that, another homegrown project was Lilo and Stitch. This is one of the money shots where Stitch goes into hyperspace. I was very fortunate to get a scene that later became the title shot. We worked on this off and on for about a year. Kept coming back for revisions. Worked with the great and the late uh, Mary Lusher. May she rest in peace. Fantastic cinematographer, scene planner, and many of these scenes uh, we worked together quite extensively. Everything you would see on this reel would be considered a level five or level four, at least in the first bit. And then when we get to the junior animation reel, you'll see that uh, the work is not quite as complex. Lilo and Stitch was a really fun movie. Uh, really enjoyed working with the director. Chris Sanders had a very particular vision. He brought a lot of energy. He and Dean Dubois, who was his co-director, they knew what they wanted and they kept the production a lot of fun. And the style itself was uh, what we call chunky and nubby. Whereas Beauty and the Beast was a completely different style. This is the human again sequence. Color palette is obviously like French Rococo. So it's more kind of quasi European. Although I will say the palette for most animated films on balance, if you compare it to a live action feature, tend to be a, a lot more saturated. Emperor's New Groove uh, was called Kingdom of the Sun. When we had started on it, it originally was uh, directed by the same director as Lion King. They decided to go for a different demographic. They kind of uh, moved more to the Saturday Night Live crowd. This is a short, John Henry. We were telling the story both through the quilt of John Henry's youth, 
and then the uh, subset style was a Harlem Renaissance and we were doing that with rough animation that went straight to color from rough uh, juxtaposed against scratch board backgrounds as an adult as you can see here combined with stories of his youth that were more flat in 2D. So got to work on the sequence where he busted the mountain, the steam drill, and uh, it was a fun experience because on shorts you, you typically can innovate both creatively and technically. We're gonna get into that a little bit later. On Pocahontas, I was a rookie animator, so not necessarily getting the level five scenes, but uh, certainly getting some good shots with magic leaves, a lot of props, a lot of really dramatic lighting effects. And of course, the film that probably everyone knows the, the most, I would say that I did the least as an actual supervising animator because I was just getting into the business. So a lot of these scenes were working hand in glove with other uh, department heads like Jeff Dutton, uh, animators like Troy Gustafson. And of course, you'd be lucky because every once in a while they would throw you a full animation scene to work on. The innovation on this film uh, was technical with the Wildebeest Stampede, but also creatively uh, using the armature of Hamlet, which was unusual at the time, uh, using a Shakespearean mode to talk about uh, deeper aspects of life and death. Pretty heavy stuff for kids. And then my first film was Trail Mix Up. A lot of props, organic elements. I would say this is the Tex Avery style. The animator for all the organic stuff here, the main animator was Chris Jenkins. A great opportunity to, uh, to really learn because very compressed uh, production schedule on shorts. And so that represents um, some work that was done up into 2004. Lately, I've been working on an iPad almost exclusively. Before that, I had made the transition into digital using the Cintiq. We're gonna start with the beauty passes on everything and then uh, work through the different elements of each scene. We're always talking about pushing shapes, uh, shape language, shape symbology. Our main job is to organize chaos and to turn it into paintable shapes because nature really doesn't have any hard lines. But if we're really trying to create depth and puncture the picture plane, We'll use things like line hierarchy and all sorts of depth cues like atmosphere and really pushing the silhouettes through interpolation and value. So I decided on this particular effect to focus a little bit more on the details because it's relatively high resolution and the scene could be uh, repurposed as a game asset because it's a fully contained thing that stays within the field or event that stays within the field but then also it's high enough detail that you could focus in and use it as a film asset. Electricity is one of the more fun things to animate because you don't have to worry about interior details. It's actually something that you can animate very quickly. And there's a lot of different tricks to, uh, to creating that kind of flashing effect. So in terms of fire and smoke, I would say that everything is fractal. So fire is made up of flamelets, water is made up of droplets, waves are made up of wavelets, smoke is made up of smokelets, if there is such a word. In this case, I'm massaging the line, but I'm also thinking about the internal and the exterior silhouette. And as I said, I'm manicuring this because I'm, I'm taking it to color. So the whole idea is how can I delineate nature as a paintable shape um, and as something that will suspend our disbelief and also have persistence of vision, also known as flicker fusion. In 2D animation, it's 24 frames per second. So typically we'd animate here on fours, build up the interior details, and then eventually begin to articulate those as I say, massage is a line, think about line hierarchy. But the great thing about using the iPad is that I can go through every part of the production pipeline. And that means all the way to clean up to color and even doing a lot of the uh, post effects like the Gaussian blurs, uh, opacity, things like that. So this reel also has a little bit of character stuff. This was a character demo that I did in Japan this summer at the Kanagawa Institute of Technology. 
This was a three hour demo that I later cleaned up uh, in Photoshop. So this just shows that process there. Then I took that into my Annie 398, designing 2D effects for video games, and then added almost straight ahead the VFX pass. Typically you'll, like I said, you'll animate on fours and eights. In this case, it was really just twos and ones because I was really pressed for time. Wouldn't recommend animating straight ahead uh, for anyone who uh, is not animated at least for a few years and intrinsically understands timing. So this is what we call benevolent cheating, repurposing uh, two different elements multiple times to make you feel that you're looking at a lot of different events. And uh, here's the actual breakdown. You'll also notice in this particular case, my pipeline includes uh, Procreate and Rough Animator, sometimes Photoshop. But in this case, I started uh, the keys. I did them traditionally on fours. Part of this was uh, a demo that I had started at CTN, the Creative Talent Network. I've been a demo artist uh, at the station for a number of years there. So then going into the smoke process, uh, we're always thinking about big, medium, and small shapes in animation and specifically in VFX animation and always trying to pop the silhouettes because you can get lost in all these shapes very, very easily because there's a lot of repetitive shapes. So the trick is to find that sweet spot, that right balance of the repetitive shape, but also you've got to create areas to relax the eye, areas of space. The next one is called wave design. I'm working on the wave animation right now, so this will give you a little bit of the process about how I approach the keys all the way to the color shot. As you can see, this is gonna be a very complicated level five scene because there's a lot of overlapping action. There's a lot of things going on, a lot of different levels. As I mentioned, you have to think of nature from a fractal standpoint. So as I said, waves are made up of wavelets. Think of it as a Mandelbrot set, right? As a, as a fractal. And all nature has really just only so many shapes. So for instance, the surf, that's kind of smoke language because it has a lot of particulate matter. So it tends to be denser and heavier. The wave could also be repurposed there. Believe it or not, there's a lot of fire language internally that's going on uh, with these stretch shapes on the, on the interior. I just finished this avalanche. This took about four weeks uh, from the beginning rough till that shot right there. The thing about these types of shots is you're always saying, you know, who's the star of the show? There always has to be some, some progression forward, some kind of revelation. Whether you're doing character, whether you're doing 2D uh, VFX animation, you always have to think about the beginning, the middle, and the end. Kind of the book ends and then what, what happens in the middle. But also, what is the revelation? What's the revelatory action that's happening that, that makes this thing seem to have a life of its own. Because again, the idea is uh, not just organizing chaos, but caricaturing nature. And nature is the best teacher. I may not be looking specifically at reference for this specific shot, but I've studied enough animation reference, both in teaching and also just professionally, that I have kind of an internal arsenal of, of things that I can pull from which of course would suggest that it's a war and sometimes it feels like a struggle. Sometimes it's really tough to muscle through this because it's a lot of work. If you wanna be an animator, it's a maximum effort, minimal return. So you have to just get used to just committing to the hard work. So the tone pass and the shadow pass is what you're seeing here. And then of course the research, uh, I'm not gonna get as much into the video research, but I will show this, which is just teaching students how to extrapolate from uh, a video, you need to learn the craft so you can forget it. It's like the Jedi, right? It's like Luke Skywalker putting on uh, the visor and then having to trust his instincts. There's a lot of intuition that comes with also teaching your hand the skills, but make no mistake about it, everything that I'm showing you is a skill that can be learned. Talent is a uh, throwaway word and it's a bit of a misnomer anyway. I do want to talk about the technical challenges and the creative challenges of working on these films. Some of these were my challenges. Some of these were the challenges of my department. 
And some of them were just challenges of the entire production. And of course, I will uh, give credit where credit's due because remember, animation is a collaborative art. If you do not like to collaborate, if you do not like to work with people, if you want to be an auteur, I don't think animation is a business you'll find that's very fun because someone's always looking over your shoulder. So crowd simulation was definitely something that was pioneered uh, on The Lion King. The wildebeest were the same wildebeest that was copied many times over. And then uh, the simulation, of course, had to uh, not have them melding together and turning into two-headed wildebeest, but steering away from each other. But in order to kind of hide our footsteps, because you know that they call it movie magic for a reason, because magic is about fooling you. It's about misdirection. Inattention blindness, you can only register seven, maybe six moving objects at a time. And we can capitalize on that. Part of the misdirection in this case would be to add hand animated wildebeest here and there. It just adds to this texture that you're looking at discreetly animated characters. Now, if you think about the trajectory of how technology works in film, it's just amazing. It's a quantum leap, sometimes from picture to picture, but definitely from decade to decade. So if you looked at how they did crowds back in the old days, like Cinderella, it was just like a, a still painted background with characters that were just kind of frozen in space. And here you have all these discreetly animated, simulated characters, all with different behaviors. But one of the things they learned on Hunchback was that if you have an established shot and you, you keep the camera on the characters for a length of time, you'll begin to notice certain repeated behaviors. They took some lessons from that and applied it to Mulan, where each of the Huns that are modeled on top of their horses have not just one looping behavior, but three looping behaviors. So then when you stagger all of those copies at the same time, it adds an element of randomization. Procedural animation and dynamics, I would say, was relatively in its infancy. The packages were very different. Maya was not as robust. It was uh, alias Wayfront before it became Maya. Even Houdini had not really gotten to procedural modeling at that point. It was really just a particle program. But a lot of the particles we used, in fact, were uh, proprietary. If you remember, just looking at the reel, when he touches that uh, magic funnel, it suddenly explodes into this aurora borealis. And then there were a lot of procedurally generated waterfalls because there were a lot of them. So anytime you have a lot of repetitive behaviors, it's best to, to minimize the uh, man hours. Rob Bacours uh, helped pioneer the Inkaline tool. Just like with the Wildebeest DMP, this was to hide the tracks and to make anything that would have been modeled to feel more like it was organically drawn with thicks and thins, which was the style of Lilo and Stitch. Kirk Garfield was a technical artist that was attached to our units on Brother Bear, and he worked with me to help me understand PS Tool. And also he did a lot of work himself on anything that's going to be highly repetitive. That said, in the explosion below, all those little particles that I drew on the explosions up close, those are done with a Sharpie. But all the stuff you see in the background, again, is Darlene uh, Hadrika. We had very primitive cloth simulator and PS tool. And uh, again, the technical artist has set up the parameters for me, making it a lot easier to animate. So one of the big money shots was the multi-element compositing for the firework sequence. Uh, David Tidgewell, who was the effects supervisor, he's the one who did this money shot. And then on the lower left corner, James Mansfield, uh, he animated this particular scene, but I also um, had to do a lot of snow as well. And we had to integrate it according to the art director's uh, or production designer's wishes to integrate them to make them feel like they were seamless. So in this case, we had to do a lot of hand rendering and a lot of compositing to make that snow feel dimensional. There were a lot of cinegraphic innovations, uh, so to speak, beginning with Beauty and the Beast, the ballroom sequence, allowed us to see the characters dancing uh, in the round, which was an innovation. Again, the technical challenge was, well, then how do we have stylistic cohesion? How do we make the background look like it's a 2D element? And how do we make that look like it matches the characters? So I don't think they were successful because they were pioneering that technology. By the time they got to Tarzan with Deep Canvas, they had figured out how to create the models and then have the hand-painted textures on top. So Tarzan could skate in and around very dimensionally. Faux plane was used in Mulan. This is a way of taking a background and making it feel like a hologram. In this establishing shot of the Great Wall, as we truck out, it looks like there's actual dimension, but it's in fact just creating this illusion. Perhaps the best cinegraphic innovation was when Kenai, uh, we see from his POV, when he awakes and he becomes a bear. We go from this muted palette to this very saturated palette. We also go from 35 millimeter to cinemascope. The shape 
and the color of an object can really determine whether it's a protagonist or an antagonist, whether or not we've, we really feel comfortable with this character. So Stitch and Mickey Mouse are definitely based on circles. Any type of benign character is going to be based on curvilinear shapes. Also, you know, blues and greens tend to be the color of safety, whereas the inverse is true. If we want to look at a villain, the downward facing triangle that we, we look at from predators or from scales, the color palette of danger, you know, poisonous snakes, uh, bees, so the reds, the yellows, oranges, blacks, we use those in our own construction signs because we're hardwired to see these things. As you can see here, the villains in this final shot designed by Chin Yi, also animated by Travis Blaze. They, of course, are primarily curvilinear, so sometimes you cast against type and uh, rules were meant to be broken, right? So it's not a rule that a character, if they're a protagonist, they have to be uh, curvilinear, as in the case with Milo from Atlantis. Oftentimes, we're, uh, we're keying off of a certain element that will define the shape language. So in the case of Mike Gabriel and the beautiful designs he did for Pocahontas, there's a rectilinear kind of uh, regalness to these backgrounds that was really picked up in the characters and also the straight against curve and looking at Landecker as a subset style. Mulan, of course, was a very interesting film because Mulan goes from having a curvilinear face to a rectilinear face. So her model literally changes once she gives up her symbol of femininity, which is her lotus comb, and she picks up her father's uh, armor and his sword and goes to battle. You, you have to kind of look at the long view. You can make a beat chart for a story, but you can make a beat chart for editing. You can also make a beat chart for color. So for instance, in most movies you may not be aware, the closer we go from the inciting incident up the, you know, from the catalytic event, uh, and uh, the upward trajectory toward the climax, the edits get shorter and shorter. Also, there's usually a trajectory, um, if you're looking at, in this case, The Lion King, kind of looked at as a barcode, right? So you can see the different sequences and the colors, but you can see it kind of culminate in danger, right? So you can see the fire sequence at the end. And you can do this through color keys. And the color keys at the bottom would be an example of taking a sequence and working out in a thumbnail view, what does this art direction look like before committing a lot of money to, to doing the full painting. And then also if you wanna do a period piece, if you like Pocahontas was a period piece, uh, to a degree, so was Mulan. And, and uh, you wanna be careful not to culturally misappropriate or to make mistakes. So you have to do a fair amount of research, but also just, uh, just have consistency through style guides and through art direction. So these style guides can be very comprehensive Usually, they're also a primer for design. We're not just teaching someone the design, but we're teaching new you know, recruits, people who are interns and eventually coming onto production. My favorite part of all this is the storytelling continuity. So in this case, Chris Sanders connected the world of Lilo to Stitch. They're both orphans. They both bite people. They're both about the same size, and they're both comfortable when they're away from humanity, Stitch in the vacuum of space, and Lilo in the ocean. And so they wanted to connect that language from those two disparate worlds, uh, Earth and outer space, and they did so by making all the spaceships fish. In the case of the mothership, it's a whale. In the case of the uh, ship that he commandeers, the little red spacecraft, it's a manta ray. When he first is brought in, it's a crab ship, and so on and so forth. Another important thing is critical thinking. You always have to ask yourself why, why this, why not that? Let's find the shorthand for telling the quickest story. You've gotta be able to tell a story in, as I said, in a moment. So when we see these three different characters who have very different characteristics, one's a protagonist, one's an antagonist, and one is kind of a buffoon, but he's a sophisticated buffoon, uh, Wiggins. So when Ratcliffe, who's the villain, when he comes up the ship, we see this rat scurry up uh, in front of him. And that tells us in a snapshot who this character is and what his intentions are. We see John Smith, Captain John Smith on the cannon. We know he's going to get into danger, perhaps adventure. But when we were thinking about Wiggins coming out of, the, uh, out of his carriage, we initially thought, well, if he's decadent, he's going to be carrying all these things that speak to that. But it's visual clutter, literally visual clutter. And a better story is him coming out of the carriage and presenting Percy. It tells a quicker story, a better story, visually cleaner story. Another thing too is you can look at reference, but the reference may not necessarily send you down the right path. So in this case on Mulan, I was pulling some of these earlier designs to the left. First thing the director said is, well, it's just too cumbersome. I mean, they're gonna be moving through snow. So even uh, the example at the bottom, like with the wheels, that, that, that's not gonna help anyone, right? What we discovered is we needed a weapon that would be iconic and that would be mobile. And so this was the best way of telling the story. Similarly, with the uh, opening shot 
originally there were some ideas about siege warfare, you know, and uh, looking at maybe a scaling ladder. But of course, as we know, the Huns, I mean, maybe at some point they, they did adopt that, but we typically think of them as being stealthy, being on horseback. And a better introduction, again, with this shape language is uh, the grappling hook coming out of the, out of the darkness. My favorite marriage of form, function, and utility uh, is, is the sword itself, which represents, as Joseph Campbell would say, the threshold of adventure. So when she opens the scabbard, and she pulls the sword out of the scabbard, it's not just baring its teeth, but it's presenting her with the two different sides of who she represents, the masculine, the feminine. And as we know with the hero cycle, she's going to cross that threshold to adventure, and she's going to have to eventually return across that threshold, which she does once she defeats the enemy. I talked earlier about style guides and model sheets and reference. I tend to think of art in four parts. Investigation, which is the reference and the research. Uh, inspiration, which are the initial drawings and spitballing that happens based on that, right? The thumbnails and the composites. And then of course, the execution, which is uh, the model sheets or maybe this final color background would be execution. But innovation is the hardest and innovation is to make the thing that we have not seen. Because the hardest thing for an artist to do, quite frankly, is to compose a story out of a blank screen. To have this job where you sit down in front of a blank computer screen or a blank piece of paper and to conjure something that will suspend someone's disbelief and have continuity and make it feel like it was all done by the same hand, a story told by the same person from maybe the same POV, depending on what the story is. And to make someone laugh or to make someone cry, that is a very tall order. It's very, very hard in the entertainment industry to coax emotions out of people. Probably easier to make someone laugh, to do a gag, than it is to make someone cry. I think Lilo and Stitch had a bit of both. It was a great admixture and there was a lot of dimension because you know, there's the fun and games part of storytelling, which is what you know people do pack the theaters because they want to see special effects and they want to see all sorts of uh, really cool animation and designs. But what they really want to do is connect on a human level. A bad story will never be fixed by good animation. Bad animation will never kill a really good story. So what does that mean? The takeaway is the story is the most important thing, being a visual storyteller and connecting with the audience. So in the case of Lilo and Stitch, the movie is not really about an alien and it's not really just about this orphan who gets visited by the social worker. It's about family and uh, sometimes about dysfunctional families that have to come together. We have to see them reconcile in order for us to feel good about it. So again, this, this falls under both what I would call execution and innovation because uh, the Chris Sanders style was, was highly unique, very appealing character, something of an anti-hero. We're not really sure how to take him is, in the beginning. Is he a villain? Is he a good guy? Is he cute? Is he menacing? Well, as it turns out, he's kind of a, a lot of all the above. Another thing that happens with style guides is, as I said, we're, we're teaching the new generation, the people just coming in, but sometimes we're reteaching ourselves. But here, we actually see instructions on how to hold the pencil differently. So that's very interesting, right? Because we think that as artists, we know already how to do it. We're already professionals. So sometimes these guides, they'll break something down to its most simple component parts. And it's a primer for how to have consistency. As I said, trying to suspend your disbelief, trying to make it feel like it's the same hand. Now, you will see again and again, you'll see this shape language thing keep showing up. Oftentimes model sheets and style guides are uh, a list of do's and don'ts. Also looking at process, you know, how, how then can we take that inspirational drawing and how can we now execute? How can we take that through the, uh, through the compositing and for the coloring process? What does that look like when we go from the concept, in this case, the uh, glacier calving on the left, which was a very pivotal moment in the movie uh, to Jason Wolbert's animation we saw earlier. Well, the color temperature changed but the gist of it is the same. And that is the job of the concept artist. These slides were put together in a Project 101 class run by Matt Brunner in 2016. Uh, he is now heading up our game projects for the sophomore side. And I thought I would repurpose them here. Thank you, Matt, for putting these together because he canvassed his students. He found out, first of all, well, how many of you are interested in the film industry? How many of you want to go into games? And then he asked him, you know, what do you want to do? What do you see yourself doing um, in this industry? And of course, not everyone has an informed idea about, they, they just know what they like to do. You know, maybe I, I like to, to doodle, I like to sketch, you know, uh, I love to create my own worlds. 
but you know, we have to figure out what our actual vocation is and we have to have a realistic look at where the jobs actually are. So in this uh, canvassing of this uh, freshman class, I'm noticing that, wow, 3D animation and 3D character modeling are the lowest on the totem pole, whereas character design and story seem to be the highest. Luckily, technical art is up there and that happens to be, as we'll discuss, a very viable field. So Matt did this really cool thing where he, uh, he looked at three different uh, high-level assets at uh, three different flagship companies. Notice how few concept artists that you need. And story artists for film tend to be more than uh, other businesses, but it's still not even 20. And, and we're talking about for an entire production cycle, which could be productions usually about two years, pre-productions about three, and then post-productions anywhere from six to one. Uh, or six six months rather to one year. So you could be looking at for a movie like Coco, that movie took from stem to stern, took about six years. But the production itself, once you get out of visual development, previs, you know, and everything's tied down and it's greenlit, then you're getting into just executing. And the execution of a film, depending on how many people you have, is anywhere between one to two years. Uh, usually not more than that because productions tend to start firing in all cylinders. And they also have very stringent production deadlines. And unfortunately in this business, deadline has the word death in it. <laughs> it sounds a little dangerous, but it's kind of true, right? They're, they're very serious because they do a lot of tie-ins with other companies. And so getting things done in a timely fashion is one aspect uh, to the learning curve, not just having the skill set, but being able to do things quickly. So here we'll see VFX artists. There's a fair amount, a lot of background uh, modelers, tech artists. If you put all the tech art together, it would be your biggest category. And that's especially true for a movie that more might be more like a hybrid. Movies like uh, anything in the Marvel Universe, anything coming you know, out of way to Peter Jackson, uh, where you're trying to meld fantasy with realism, and then you have to match the lighting, you have to have a real good sense of, of cinematography uh, and the camera, and, uh, and also uh, scale and believability. A very different type of film, so compositing becomes a really huge thing. Also, TDs, again, uh, would be the biggest category if you put them all together, technical directors or technical artists, which is to say people working within each silo, as you can see, you could be a TD in lighting, you could be a TD in, in effects, but your job is to create those tools that we talked about earlier. So you have to be something between a technician and an artist. And then of course, um, I, I keep coming back to the concept, but it's not to dissuade anyone from going into to those fields. It's to say that usually you want to have two skill sets. You want to have, uh, it's a T-shape. The I part of that T is going to be your biggest skill set. That's your most specialized. It's going to catch someone's attention. But then you have one other major skill or series of skills that lay on top of that. And that T-shape person is a person who is somewhere between a specialist and a generalist and usually has skills that are related. So if I'm an animator, I can be a, uh, you know, a rigger. If I'm a story artist, maybe it also is good to be a 2D animator. If I'm a 3D animator, maybe I also want to be a rigger. Or actually, even concept art is good for all the above. You'll find in many programs across the United States, including our own, concept art is just embedded into programs because you need to be able to visually solve stories. So same thing if you want to be an environment modeler. It would be good to be able to understand how to construct environments uh, from a 2D sense as well. Last, we're going to look at a game project. This is Assassin's Creed. Uh, syndicate. Uh, this is done by Ubisoft, which is a French company. So the art standards at Ubisoft are incredibly high, probably some of the highest in the game industry. They're, they're very much known for their art. Again, story, concept, uh, very minimal. If you want to be those types of artists working at that level, you're competing against people like Paul Felix and Carter Goodrich, Peter Desev, you know, Mike Mignola. You name your famous person, they're probably gracing the cover of The New Yorker. But look how many people you need to make the environments. Look how many sets and BGs. Look how many 3D animators. And again, how many technical artists. There is definitely a different career in every pull down menu in Maya. So my recommendation to anyone is you're never gonna learn the complete interface of any program, uh, every bell and whistle, and it's not necessary. Learn how to have a limited palette. It's about the tool, not the user. That's why we're very software agnostic in our school. So in general, that, uh, that's a talk. We can drill down in another talk uh, more about the industry because uh, definitely one hour is not enough time to, uh, to talk about all this. Thank you so much uh, for looking at this presentation and I will leave you with this one last slide, the aggregate of all the different things we're looking at. And so it's just a snapshot. And as you can see, technical art is king if you're gonna be on one of those hybrid films, but definitely 3D animators, modelers, 
you know, that's really where a lot of the jobs are. So if you can have any kind of overlapping skill set, uh, particularly with those big three, some of the other um, ancillary fields, then you'll have more of a chance for success when you're, when you're coming out of school. Again, my name is Jasna Frankour. Thank you so much for your time, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.